Mm-hmm. And I ask that you open our hearts and open our minds so we can receive this teaching that Ms. Kim is teaching. I ask that you guide us and bind up any spirits that are not of you. And I ask that you continue to fill your seas into us and empty us of, of the world so you can fill us more of yourself so we can act and become more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, we just thank God for that word. We thank God for the families. Um, I think um, um, Talana, her aunt passed, and so we're praying for them. And uh, we're praying for Honora's um, little uh, little girl who got kicked out of school this week. And um, so we're praying for her to um, have an um, obedient spirit um, and um, that kind of thing. And we're praying for each and every one of us who have been feeling heaviness in the name of Jesus. We just ask God to um, move the heavy weights and the burdens. And we ask God right now to allow the blood of Jesus to come into our midst and um, begin to destroy the yokes of the enemy. For the word of God says that where two or three of us are gathered, God is in the midst of us. And so we all agree on the blessing of the Lord and the seeds, as she just said, being sold into us. It's all by faith. And so we thank God for a spirit of prayer falling on us where we begin to pray unceasingly in the name of Jesus and that we begin to move by the power of God in his spirit and less of ourselves. And we bind and rebuke anything that tries to hinder our progress. And we thank God for moving the mountains right now in the name of Jesus. We thank you for wisdom and knowledge and revelation that you're releasing to your children right now. Thank you that it is less of us and more of you. In the mighty name of Jesus, you've given us the power to tread down the lion, adder, and serpent, and in no way shall anything harm us. You gave us a sound mind that we shall not fear anything. For God, you have not given us a spirit of fear, but a sound mind and power. And because of this, we give you praise. We worship you in spirit and truth. And we know that anything that any of your children have went through in the last week, right now you're here on the line purging and you're releasing them from the thoughts of yesterday, bringing them into this present moment in time. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. Okay, so I am thankful for the notes, and um, I also have the link from last week, and we'll be uh, recording this week um, as well. Usually I, I record, but I forget to send it. So, excuse me, I'm going back to the topic from last week just to... Um, gather more information and to help us with where we are right now. So the enemy of my destiny, why is there an enemy fighting us regarding our destiny? And I have question mark. If the fight is great and apparent, it could be because you have greatness within you. The other thing is it could be us making wrong choices and consequences starting to show up because of um, the choices we've made. So we have two um, variances here. Um, however, when the enemy of our destiny shows up, we should recognize more than anything the possibilities of leaving a legacy behind um, within the potential of our greatness. Um, the reason for that is is that we were sent here to do something. And that's something we have to get over to one another and those that we work with because spirituality is nothing without understanding your destiny and your destiny leads to legacies. Um, it can be, um, you know, legacies of kingdoms, of worldwide um, um, takeover, and it could be, a legacy to change the dynamics of your family. 
However, you have three circumferences, and it starts within the family. It goes into the communities, and then you have the city and state. Then you're in the world, the world uh, range, which is the fourth um, circumference. So if you write down the um, information, what you want to begin to look at is that oftentimes we've been in church and we're not learning about our destiny. We're learning more about our emotional needs being gratified and our material needs being gratified. Our emotional needs are gratified through the spirit of God, but it is also through truth being released into our loins and our um our being because until that happens we continue to make choices that give us um, hurtful consequences so there we have the enemy of our destiny being ourself but also the enemy of our destiny being ignorance it has nothing to do with people because what we lack within is what we're going to lack without okay so we move on and then we go back to the legacy. The destiny is always going to lead you, lead you to a destiny. I mean, a legacy, the destiny is always going to lead you to a legacy because you're going to leave something behind positive to change the circumstances of your generation. It doesn't matter how phenomenal or how big it is. There's something that we have to work towards that God has given us concerning a destiny that will lead a change in our generations, okay? And so you, you, you look at your own potential, you know, and then you deal with yourself concerning the doubt. And those mindful words to say, how could I be? I can't see it on the outside of me because it's inside of you. Nothing is in, outside of you that you have not manifested already. Everything that you need for the creation of God it starts within. For all the sons and daughters are waiting on the creation and the manifestation of the sons and daughters of God. Um, that's in Romans. Let me find it. All of creation awaits the manifestations. of the sons and daughters of God. And as you say that to yourself, you begin to get a revelation of the truth in that word. It says 8 and 19 of Romans. It says, I, 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 I consider that our, our present sufferings are not comparable to the glory that will be revealed in us get it, in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the revelation of the sons of God. All of this has to do with the individual. And you can go back to 18, it says Romans 8, 18 through 20. For the creation was subjected to futility, not by its own will, but because of the one who subjected it. And that's the one that we... Um, were born through. Um, I consider that our present sufferings are not comparable to the glory that we will be revealed in us, never outside but inside. So your destiny awaits within you. The creation waits in eager expectation for the revelation of the sons of God, the revealing of the sons of God, the sons of God to get revelation of who they are. And in some of the texts, it says sons and daughters, okay? So going back, it says, um, um, when you look at the potential 
or you even observe the potential within yourself and you put destiny, legacy, potential, destiny, potential, legacy, potential, destiny, legacy, you know, write the words down. When you begin to look at them, you get a better understanding of the possibilities that you have to create the same destiny that your family did or create a greater one. But it's up to us to look at it. And then you can ask yourself, but why would I create and leave a, a legacy? Because I bring up questions because God questions me. God doesn't always give me the answers. I get questions so that I can be provoked to think, which is what we need to do. Um, when Jesus wrote the parables or spoke parables, we see um, that there is thought-provoking. Many times, um, as long as the Bible has been in the earth realm, people read it and they don't understand the parables. And it's because the parables are written for wisdom, people with wisdom, people that have awakened to um, divine understanding and wisdom. So those that are not awakened will not be able to read in spirit and truth. And these are important facts because a lot of it, it separates us from religion and spirituality. A person that's religious is going to read Romans 8 and 19 like this. I consider that our present sufferings are not comparable to the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the re revelation of the sons of God. That's it. But that's not how it goes. The word of God has a deeper meaning. And that's why Paul said in Corinthians that he says the letter kills, but the spirit brings life. This letter, to read it as so I just did, will kill you because you have no knowledge of what it's saying to you. It's giving you no guidance. It's not actually telling you anything. You understand what I'm saying? The word of God is put there for you to get the deeper meanings, which is why Jesus, um, in his exploits, he took uh, Peter, or he called him out into the deep. You cannot receive wisdom and knowledge in the surface areas of life. You'll always have to go deep to get the mystery, to get an understanding of what is bothering you, to get an understanding of anything that's perplexing you, you're going to have to step out of your comfort zone and go out into the deep, all right? Legacies are not built in a comfortable place, by the way. Your destiny is not going to be received in a comfortable place either. You're going to have to step out to get what belongs to you. These things are oftentimes taken from us because we were too comfortable or we did not fight for them like a, um, a warrior. So if you have a destiny and you are slowful, lazy, or you're a procrastinator, you're going miss, you, to miss that um, destiny. And when you miss your destiny, you're going to miss the opportunity to build a legacy for your children or your family or the city and state that God is giving you governance over. Now, all of this can be futuristic, but it's true. You may not have any kids right now. You might not even be married, but you may be called to do something great. I mean, Oprah didn't have any children, all right? But she saw it unnecessary for her to go the long mile. Now, Oprah, she has the world. When I say the world, she has all of the world looking at her through television. Now, she didn't do this on her own because she had behind the scenes something that legacies do. When you're creating a legacy, you're going to be broken. Maybe she has not been transparent, but it's there. There's no one, I don't care what associations you belong to, you're going to go through some hurt and pain, even if they called you to what is called a sacrifice. So there's nothing different about what Oprah did or what Jesus done. If you are in a legacy of a poor inheritance, you have to turn it around and it's going to cause some pain because you do not have knowledge per se or you have not 
um, birth the knowledge of how to overcome poverty. That means that it's going to give you a challenge. Poverty is going to give you a challenge. It's going to challenge you and say, do you really want to know? Well, how far will you go? Will you go for broke to prove that poverty is a lie? Will you make the sacrifices necessary to, to, to prove that poverty is a lie? So some of the questions that God can provoke us in answering the, the questions concerning the potential, the destiny, and the legacy is um, you're called to recreate new life regarding your family. Some people, they have no thought concerning the changes that they see need to be made concerning when God has given us all the potential. Can you repeat that part, Ms. Kim? You cut out. God has given us all the potential to recreate new life regarding our family and that we all see need to be changed. But someone, some people are waiting on somebody else to do it when they see it. If you see the need for change, then make the change. That's what your destiny comes in. Your potential cannot be, um, it can't be birthed until you start making different choices. You know, if, if you went, out and you looked at a car and it was not what you really wanted, then you're making a compromise. Why don't you step out on faith? Maybe your family members compromised and they never went for the gusto concerning what they wanted. Maybe they always had used cars. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing because some people buy used cars and you get more, um, the depreciation is less, but I'm making an example. Sometimes people are going for things because it's comfortable. They don't believe in anything farther than what they can see. They might have had, um, you know, you might have had prophecies about um, owning a house and a cattle on a hill. And the only thing between you and that is your faith. So your legacy in that area would not begin until you begin to make the strides. It's going to be uncomfortable because in this life or in your mind, you have not reached that concept yet, but the idea of it is for you to stretch into it. You have to see it in order to become it. And that's why Jeremiah and God had the conversation back in chapter 1 of Jeremiah that God was showing him different things in his mind. First of all, people of God say they worship God in spirit and truth, but they don't because they don't go into the place of God where God creates, which is in the mind, in the third eye. Jesus told us that the eye must become single in order for anything to come to pass. You can look the scripture up. In order for the eye to become single, there's a creativity that happens inside of man's mind. That's where God dwells. We don't manifest because we don't use what God used. In the beginning, and you always go back to the beginning when you're trying to understand or create. Well, in the process of creation for man, we have potential first. Then we have destiny. And our destiny leads us to a legacy. If it's, again, to change the family legacy, or if it's to go out into communities, whatever the anointing may be on your life, it starts with your potential. No one can recognize the potential but you. You have to believe in that potential in you. And it's not outside of you, it's inside. The destiny begins after you realize and you accept the potential. Destiny is a destination that you end up at. When you look at destiny, you can see destination there. So your destiny is going to take you to a destination. The destination is incorporated for God's good if you are a Christian and you are spiritually sound. 
But if you're not, You will not receive the things that God has given. And there's no compromising in God. The God that we serve is good. All right? And that means that there's a change in man in order for us to receive these things. You cannot get destiny or your potential to destiny if you're still living the life of an enemy. So we look back at last week and we say, the enemy of my destiny, while many continue to um, blame other people, and uh, we do. We have our on days and our off days, but we want to make more days where we understand that we are the enemy of our destiny because we allow things to happen. So we take control of our destiny with the potential there of God moving on our behalf, and we have a structure and a foundation that becomes more solid. And this is intentional. Why? Because we see that we can do something more with our lives. How be it that we can see that we can do more with our lives than we did yesterday or last year? It's a matter of decision. We make a decision. It's nothing too hard for God. We say the scriptures over and over, but the problem with The scriptures being repeated over and over is that we have not become one with it. There's no revelatory factors going on within us. We have not become one with the word. The old man has not passed away and the new has come. Because if the old man passes away, the new is going to become prominent, which is the mind of Christ. That's the old wine and the new. Jesus made wine and there was a change in the people. The wine has not became a part of who we are if we're not walking in our potential destiny and we're going on to build legacies. We're all sent here to change family matters. If we don't go into the community part, let's just stop there. Because the scriptures in uh, Deuteronomy, I'm going to skip ahead, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring um, that up. Uh, so Deuteronomy um, 6, 1 through 9, it says, God knew the necessity of one's generation. No, this is the faith part. Okay, let me go back up here. Um, if someone could go to Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 9, that would be great. And it talks about, um, uh, it talks about um, how the Jews sat at the table with um, their family members. But in the beginning, here it is. It says, love the Lord your God. These are the commands, decrees, and laws. The Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you and so that you may enjoy long life. Enjoy long life. Okay, so when you go back last week, you know, We shared individual information. But the individual walk is for a um, a legacy to change because if I don't change some things concerning me, the outcome for my children and my generations to come are going to be the same, which is why we're dealing with issues right now. We're dealing with issues concerning family, relationships that don't last because We keep getting upset with people rather than taking the time to find out why it's happening. We didn't go back and look at our families. I don't know what people think generational curses are. Even when they go to church, they're casting them down, but they do no evaluation on the family. It's not going to work because you have no knowledge of the beginning of your family situations. So as far as you could go back It is a good thing because potential is there. 
But in most cases, your potential is being robbed because the enemy of your destiny has to do with your, your past legacy, your past generation. So you can be born to a poor legacy again. King James was born into a poor kingdom. And so when we look at those um, dynamics, we maybe we get a clear concept of what we need to do. Some people look at their family foundation right now when God is telling them, you know, I'm trying to tell you something. Oh, yeah, the color purple comes to mind. It shook Avery, her father, you know, he, he, he didn't have nothing to do with her because she was a worldly type of woman. But then she come back into the picture and God is trying to tell you something right now, right now. And so him and his religious mindset broke. And him and his daughter was united at that time. Because regardless of her walk, she went on her walk for a reason. It was not for um, judgment to be passed on her. It was because God called her to the life of, of what she went through for a reason. Uh, maybe um, she was supposed to meet... Um, Whoopi Goldberg in those times and seasons that she did in the movie, for example. But then what, what our problem is is that we judge the situation rather than asking God, why am I here? Why am I experiencing this? So I remember Whoopi saying, until you do right by me, nothing. Well, you know, she had a matter of fact that she served somebody. She served them, but then she began to get wise. And so she knew what she had given him was um, God's given, um, um, given most. She, you know, she was taken from man to man and so on and so forth. Most people have seen the movie, but the example is there. It does not give us a right to kill anybody. But it does give us a right to begin to speak up and boldly take back what belongs to us. Now, you have to be careful in boldness because I didn't say anger. Boldness of Christ rises up in, in us. It is God. It is not us. Therefore, we examine ourselves and we understand that it is suffering for us not to take things into our own hands, meaning it's going to hurt you not to take things into your own hands, but the consequences are greater for you and a blessed outcome for you and your children and your children to come that you don't put your hands into something and take God on or God's work on for yourself, meaning that you accept that God is your battle axe. God is your fortress. God is your help. God is um, your strength. That means that you pray. That is your weapon against the enemy. Anything that's ever hurts you. Okay? So it goes on and says, so that you and your children and their children's children uh, may fear the Lord your God. Keeping all his decrees and the commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy life. And so you cannot enjoy life when you're constantly making the same choices that your family members made. Being put in the same position, and you don't say or do something about it, God. Maybe the situation failed because God is saying, maybe you're going to ask me now. Maybe you don't stay in my face until you get the answers because if you stay in my face, I have to answer you. Isaiah 54 tells us for a little while, I, I pretty much turned my face away from you. But as you pray and continue to pray, I'm going to turn my face back to you and I rebuild you with all kinds of stones and jewels and I'll take care of your, your children. I make your gates of carbuncle, he says. What does that mean? You know, when you read it. Put it put it put write down the number and ask yourself after you read it. What what does it really mean to you that God says, For a little while I had turned my face against you like I did the waters of Noah? But then now I'm gonna be like, I'm gonna be your husband. I'm gonna be your maker. I'm gonna be your everything. That is a commitment, 
a commitment to your potential, a commitment that as long as you, you stay with me, your destiny will be fulfilled because even now your destiny includes that I will change the de- generations concerning your children. And no weapon ever formed against you will prosper by faith if you believe. You see, enjoy life forever. It says, three, hear Israel and be careful to obey. Now, you can put your name there. Hear Kim and anybody else that's on the line. Be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord God of your ancestors. Why is God always dealing with ancestors? And then for some reason, people go over into the New Testament and think something has changed with Jesus, and it hasn't. Because Jesus went out and actually... Is everybody still on? Here. Okay, oh. yeah. Miss, Miss Kim said something about her, her internet possibly going out. So I think we should just wait a few minutes uh, for her to come back on. Okay. Does anyone have a testimony um, of this past week that they want to share? Well, if no one else has a testimony, um, I'll give mine uh, very quickly. So um, this is Anora, and um, my three-year-old, who we have in Montessori school, um, was doing great for the first, you know, six and a half months we had her in there. And then this past month, she's just had trouble with change because we went from the three-year-old room to the four-year-old room um, because she was in need of, uh, you know, something more challenging. And... Um, so I think you all heard Miss Kim, or some of you all might have heard Miss Kim say um, that we needed some prayer for Jocelyn because, you know, she had basically gotten kicked out um, because when she got unhappy, instead of using her words, she was just screaming. And so it was very frustrating, um, you know, to get multiple phone calls. So um, a lot of prayer, and um, we went ahead and, you know, kept her at home. And then the very next day, we got a call from um, a very trusted some lady that does child care within our city and was my Please testimony for the week. I apologize. Go ahead. Well, I was just sharing my testimony of um, <laughs> for the week, for this past week with Jocelyn, you know, being let go from Montessori and then, you know, um, you know <laughs> and then I'm, I get a call, you know, the next day from, you know, a trusted um, child care provider that, you know, suddenly had an opening. Amen. Yeah, she um, texted me or sent me a video. I said yes if she, if I would pray for her. And, uh, yeah, so um, God bless her. How's she doing? She's doing good, and she's looking forward to um, we're going to go ahead and, and enroll her. Instead of part-time, we're going to go ahead and do full-time. So she'll be starting full-time tomorrow. That's awesome. 
Okay, yeah. so <laughs> um, let's see. Let's go back to um and get this over. I see. Yes, yeah, seven twelve. Um, it says talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road. So that's um our understanding of home setting. Um, concerning the commandments and outside. You know, a lot of people would say that they weren't called um, to the streets, and here we have it right here in um, the um, um, Deuteronomy 6, where uh, God is explaining how his love is shared and how his love um, is towards him because the love towards God is going to be reciprocated reciprocated towards God's people. And that's one of the greatest challenges that we have as um, Christians, um, so to speak, because we, um, we're challenged to love the Lord, your God, with all your heart and with all your soul and might. This is a lot. It's far beyond words being spoken. You know, when you look at love the Lord, your God, with all of your heart, how much heart did you put into him today? And with all of your soul, what do you know about your soul and where is your soul located? With all of your strength, how many of us have really put all our strength into loving God? And these are questions that when you really start answering them, you're going to find that you're really looking at a relationship with God or going deeper because every road leads you to more sacrifice of yourself, because without sacrifice of self, there is no true blessing. We're we're truly not founded in Christ, because we have limitations as individuals and earthbound, limitations that say, well, you know what, I don't have to love God like that, because God said it ain't all like that. Okay, that might be why you're missing the mark right now. If you don't know about your soul and what your soul has been through and what it's capable of coming through, then you got another challenge here. And if you don't know the capacity of strength it takes for you to actually press into loving God, there's more for you to understand. This is all of us. Because words in the um, Bible are taken for granted. We, we take them for granted in the sense that we read them and we don't become one with them again. Without oneness, you have nothing. Jesus said, I and my Father are one. Oneness has to do with the atonement. At one, that's what it means. I'm at one with my Father. But I can't just say it because just saying it does not get the the change, the transformation that takes place in one's body to become that. I mean, every fiber, atom, and cell of our bodies have got to become one acknowledging that God is truly omnipotent. And when that happens, that's when transformations begin. That's when we're able to um, do what God has called us to do. We're able to recognize our potential and accept it, walk into destiny, and then create legacies. So verse 8 goes on to say, tie tie them. No, it says, talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. So this is on your mind all the time, the commandments. Nothing else, no worries, no concerns, really. You know, and I will look to the hills from which cometh my help. That means that I'm looking at God and nothing else. So we have some other things that we need to deal with within ourselves to really get foundation. Because as long as I look at worries and concerns, then i got problems and I make idol um, worship uh, concerning God. And God is jealous of us even when we are putting worry and concerns before him because we have put worry and concern as a God. So he says, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. All right. That is um, what God called um, the Jews to. And when we um, gave our life to Christ, we actually became Jews. And that's in Romans 2. 
you can find it, I think, around the 28th or the 30th verse um, where that um, it states that truth. And then you can see how um, the Old Testament relates to you and um, actually the unraveling of your, your inner being or who you are. Um, let's see. So it says here, let me go back real quick. Um, um, I wrote down some definitions of legacy, but before I go there, let's talk about the cost of discipleship. Because, again, many people, they take this word and they think that because they say that they're saved, that's it. Well, truly, God is working behind the scenes, but there's a part that we play in this willfully. So um, if you're called and if you hold an office and if you have any kind of um, um, yeah, office or calling on your life, let's just leave it there, then this is what happens. The cause of discipleship. It says, but Jesus told them, told him, let the dead bury the dead. That's a cost to pay because now you can't get involved in all of this here stuff. You can't be all emotional and bound up. Really get this message because now the cost of discipleship has taught you that you understand that it's a good thing the person is passing on or transitioning. Now, I don't want to be morbid, but I'm just telling you what this says, and this is who you said you gave your life to. You, however, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. This is what Jesus is saying. Still another person said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me bid farewell to my family. Then he declared, no one puts his hand to the plow and then looks back if back is fit for the kingdom. So he's telling them, I'm right here in your face, but you're telling me you got to go back and bid farewell to your family. You still don't have it. You don't understand. I'm here now. When you go back to your family, I may not be here anymore. You're not fit for this yet. Try again another day, okay? You keep going back to the family stuff, and you don't keep your mind focused on me. Didn't I tell you how it is? I, I took 12 of them, and I put them in a circle with me for a reason. 12 of them are there. They have to live with me. They can't even go and live with their families no more. Legacies. Why? Because the 12 of them, after he transitioned or ascended, what happened? This is a legacy. The legacy of the gospel is created out of 12 guys, but it was two women that saw yeah, first of all, Jesus, it was a woman that saw Jesus first. Now, the legacy that was created by the men, and they had no idea what was happening. You know, they thought they had lost him. <laughs> they didn't believe what was really happening. He told them that he was going to come back. He was going to raise from the dead. But they didn't believe him. And... This type of dead is a little bit different because all of us, we have spiritual birthings. And that's the equation of going to the cross. You cross out the error so that you can come into your potential. As long as error is living in your life, your potential is always at a low moment. You're working in your ego. You're working in the ego. So um, it says 61, this is Mark Matthew. Um, I got to come back to it because I didn't write it down. It says, um, Jesus declared no one can put who puts his hand to the plow and then looks back is fit for the kingdom. So we just kind of like play around with not being fit for the kingdom because we keep looking back. We're not looking forward. We're not even looking at how we can change the past and not have to deal with repetition or repeat patterns. See, we, we, we got to get to this place where we're allowing God to actually minister to our soul where our soul needs to be healed. 
John says, Beloved, I would that you will prosper and be in good health even as your soul. So some of the issues that we deal with are not going to end until we get accommodated or understand our soul purpose. Soul purpose. And soul purpose has to do with our potential and our destiny and then what comes after the destiny. Because your soul repeats situations from genetics. Our souls do. Our souls repeat because there's repair needed. But oftentimes no one is ministering to us concerning our souls. When you put your soul before anything else and you try to begin to get information on the soul, what's going to happen is you're going to find the issues. You can look around and see what the issues are. But if you start digging deep into the cellular realm, you're going to find out because the subconscious mind is always repeating past situations. It won't give up on past because it's like a recorder. The mind, It's a mind that is seeing things and it continues to repeat things until it's checked and it's changed. So your children will live the same life that you have. It is not because you said that they're not that it's going to change. Trust me. Our mothers and fathers said that. We got grandmothers that's past. We've seen their lives. They prayed too. What's changed? So it's not that it's not possible, but it's time to wake up and look at the generations. Look at them. I know my great-grandmother prayed. She would be in the kitchen humming and, and, and cooking the food. She had the traditional way we could not take baths on Sunday. We had to do it Saturday. All kind of stuff. But did it change the fact that her husband died or she didn't have a husband? No. And my grandmother didn't have one. So we, we have some problems. And we need to get to the core of them if we want change for our children. Stop playing around with destiny because time awaits no one. Okay, so after that, Jesus said, Thou shalt not bow down um, thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So there's something about the commandments that's being overlooked. And I remember years ago when I first moved to California, God gave me, you know, some information for children concerning the commandments. And in time, it will come where we will use it more. I've taught the people that have been with me in my studies um, perpetually on the Ten Commandments. And I'm happy with what I see in their lives because I know that some of them did not give themselves away, that they trust to stay married to God. And that's the pure part of it. You know, you open the doors to sin, and sin begins to end mistakes. That's what sin is. Sin begins to perpetuate in our lives, and we can never overcome. There's a thirst and a hunger that the flesh has or whatever, and it's not just about sex. It's about lies. It's about, you know, gossiping. It's about wherever your weakness is that you need to deal with it, to seal it up. So he says, showing no mercies, showing mercy unto thousands of them that love him. See, if you love God, you're going to begin to make some changes. And it's not always on your time. See, the time that we're in has no mercy. I know you all see this. So God gives you mercy according to your love to him. But this time, that's where your mercy and your grace is coming from, your love for him, your relationship with him, him within you, the time that you spend within him. So 
So let's just talk about the legacy a little bit so that we can wrap this up. What is the legacy and why is it important for us to obtain it? So we talked about the generations. So God has something greater for you and your, your generations and the generations to come. When I think about my grandkids, I also think about their kids and the lack that we have dealt with. Do I want that to perpetuate? I really don't. So, you know, I, I work hard as I can right now for the reasons of my family and pray for the awakening. But why do I do that? It's a burden on me because I'm called to. I couldn't do what I'm doing and work the way that I do without it being um, a, a, a call to God. God has called me to focus on this, and I can't think about anything else. But it's not just going to uh, work in my family, it's also working in my spiritual family. It's working for those that, you know, assist me in the vision. They're not causing division, the but they're assisting in the vision to grow. Why? Because it's a part of what God has called us to do to make a change in the earth realm. We say it, or I say it with conviction because I believe it. And so I work hard at it regardless of what I see anybody else doing. It's conviction in me. I cannot do anything about it. I cannot change it. Someone might say that they're interested in dating me. Well, if they can't date the vision, they cannot date me. Amen? I grow stronger in it because I believe it's been my lifeline. He, it, I am married to God before anything else. And so I believe because he has brought me out of many, many sinking waters. So my commitment has not been to him because of this. It's been because I had a foundation in Christ as a child. But the foundation awakened the faith in me at the time that was needed for me to be actually saved. It wasn't when I said or confessed that I was saved. My confession didn't do nothing for me until the time and the day came where I was drowning. My confession began to work because that's when I began to strive and fight for my life. Do you understand me? You see, it's okay to say you believe in God when you have not had a fight. But when you've had a fight and you don't know how you're going to come out, your focus begins to perpetuate on that word that you've been saying. That's why breaking is necessary. Because people go on repeating scripture and talking about stuff that they have no experience in. Wait until you get into a fight for your life. You understand? God is my help. I don't need no man. Why? Because God is the all-knowing power that will bring me out. My flesh must submit to God. Why? Because God is all-knowing, all-power. No man can do what God can do. When he saves your soul from drowning in sinking sand, and you know that God has brought you out, you know you don't need nothing but God. You allow your flesh to tell you that you need something when you need nothing but God's grace. That's it. But your flesh is weak because you have no word in you. No spiritual foundation. And so you continue to do the things you did, and you continue to come out with the same outcomes. God help us get the word in us, and the word become flesh with us. So it says building a spiritual legacy requires us to live out our faith with transparency and pass down character traits that God is refining in us. What might this look like for you when you are willing to share how you respond to hardships? 
approach your work, manage money, and make decisions, you bring tremendous life-changing potential to those around you. So one of the issues that we have right now with our spiritual leaders is that they are not transparent enough. Because people do not have enough to build their foundation off of in faith without us telling them something about how we sunk to the lowest low. They need to know it. Because they need to know that God can actually bring you out of depression. God can bring you out of mental illness. God can recover and pay off your debt. God can do it. But they don't know unless we share. We're not self-made millionaires without being self-made. God makes us over to become self-made millionaires. Now, I feel like I'm a millionaire in the heavens, and so it's going to come into the earth. And it's not so much about the money, but it is about the energy of a millionaire. Because if I have the energy of a millionaire, then it's going to carry over and I can give it to others. This is the thing. People don't understand what the anointing is. The anointing came to destroy the yoke of the enemy. The anointing destroys the yoke in you that is not allowing you to grow, develop, or to be blessed. That's energy. Energy. If your energy is low, you can know that your ability to attract is low. So you got to do some things about it. You got to get your body in order with what's going on with God. So when you're willing to um, share your hardships and how you've dealt with life, so you add to people's life and their potential because you give them the ability to see the, 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 the path of Christ in you. That's what Jesus was doing. He just gave us the way. He showed us the way. And he said, you got to mark out error before you can get anything. Error got to go. Erroneous thinking has to go. Why? Because if it doesn't, there's no room for God's positive blessings. There's no gratefulness there. There's no love. There's no peace. There's no joy. Without it, you, you can't manifest. We can't. Even when your life seems like a train wreck, God can and will use your experiences to help others grow when you trust him with every area of your life and depend on his word and live in community with other believers. Everything that we just talked about, potential, destiny, legacies. You know, legacies are built in communities, but they start also first in the home. You're going to practice in your home first to follow the word of God. And it's amazing how, you know what, I'm not going to get into that. Anyway, it says um, a gift of, let's see, where are we? A legacy is inevitable. I want to go down. Hold on. So I was looking at... um, the um, definition of legacy and maybe I pass it up yeah um, it's okay so they have here that a, a, um, a gift a legacy is a gift of property especially personal property money by will those are material Um, a bequest, anything handed down from the past as from an ancestor or predecessor. So anything that's passed down, so that means that it can actually be something that you don't want, all right? So we have legacies that are not conducive to our liking and what is um, the outcome of, of this information, to let us know that we have the power to change um, what we don't like about our circumstances. So we have our uh, potential, the potential to do and be and have more out of life. 
the potential to walk the path that God has given us. Um, the path, I should say, that God has given us. In that potential, we open up to our destiny. And through the destiny opening, what we find is we have the ability to create legacies beyond um, those that we've been given, some we did not care for. Um, this is... um. Let's see. I'm just going to look up. Okay, First Timothy 6 and 6. It says, um, we all have different vices. Um, no, I don't want that. I just want to. It says, a good man, in Proverbs 13 and 22, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. So a good man is not looking at um, what he has as being sufficient. He's working actually to provide for the next generation and generations to come to be um, built sufficiently. Uh, when we look at T.D. Jakes, we can see someone that has went the long haul, and he was um, poor, poor, poor. And he has created a legacy within a legacy because even his daughters are, you know, motivational speakers now. Um, so they've done some dynamic change, and those are the changes that we have um, the ability to make when we accept who we are and we begin to work as a uh, unit. Um, because we not we're not able to build singly, but we're building um, on a network network level. No one can build. He couldn't build like that. People went with him to Texas from uh, the Carolinas, and so we began to understand um, the dynamics of number one our families and the changes, and then uh, the communities um, and our network as a community spiritually. Amen. Any questions? No, ma'am. Okay. God bless. So, with no questions and all, we will begin to um, to uh, close up. I'm going to ask someone to pray. I'll pray. Amen. Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for bringing us all together this evening. Lord God, I want to thank you for the word. And um, I want to ask that you please help us to just resonate with our spirit, Lord God. Help us to take it in and be able to meditate, it, meditate on everything that we've learned and on the word um, tonight and for the rest of this week, Father God, and fill it with the difference. Um, Father God, I want to thank you for um, Miss Kim and, and teaching us about the word and, and you know, what a, what a legacy really is and how to leave one behind, Father God. I want to ask that you please bless everybody as they go about their work week, Father God. Bless their families. Um, I want to thank you for the love and protection that you give us, Father God. Comfort, Father God, and, and always claiming us, Father God, always giving us a second chance. We just want to, you know, thank you for not leaving us, not forsaking us, Father God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful week. Amen.